Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays at the Fine Arts Museums. We are so thrilled that you're able to join us tonight. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and every Wednesday night, my team and I work hard to center representation and accessibility to the arts in unexpected and meaningful ways. Tonight's program is in support of the exhibition, The De Young Open, which hangs on our museum walls as we sadly just had to close our doors due to COVID regulations. This beautiful salon-style exhibition features works by 762 Bay Area artists, but I'll let Tim explain further. At the end of this presentation, please join us for a live Q&A with the artists. Just drop your questions in the chat box. It is such an honor to introduce Timothy Anglin Bagard. Tim is the Distinguished Senior Curator and Curator in Charge of American Art here at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. He is the curator of 29 exhibitions and the author and co-author of 17 books and nine scholarly articles. He is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards and just an all-around wonderful colleague. Please join me in welcoming Timothy Anglin Bugard. Welcome everyone. I'm Timothy Anglin Bugard, curator in charge of American art for the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and more relevantly to today's discussion, curator of the De Young Open. We are thrilled to have three of the artists who participated in the De Young Open with us today, Oren Carpenter, Every Kwong, and Rupi C. Tut. And our whole goal today is to hear about their works, their voices, and their visions. And I wanted to start just very quickly by introducing the De Young Open. I know many of you have seen it. I hope the rest of you have an opportunity to go in person. You can also look at it online. It is an extraordinary exhibition. As you know, we put out the call to all nine Bay Area counties. Every artist, regardless of their background, their training, uh, their level of skill, knowledge, all the above, everyone was invited to apply and they did. We had 6,188 artists submit 11,514 works to the exhibition. And these were juried by seven jurors, four fine arts museums curators, and three of our most esteemed and respected Bay Area artists, Mildred Howard, Hung Lu, and Enrique Chagoya. And out of that enormous response from the Bay Area community, uh, the jurors selected 762 artists who have 877 works in the exhibition. So we wanted to be able to talk to three of the artists today and what they have in common among other things, even though their styles are very diverse, their interests are diverse, every artist is a unique individual by definition, is that they all feel compelled to address serious political, social, global issues through their works. And this seemed like a very timely topic for many obvious reasons, and for some maybe less obvious that we're gonna dig deeper into as we talk about the artists and their works. So first up is Oren Carpenter. You can see his works in the very first gallery of the exhibition, and I wanna welcome him to this webinar, and please take it away, Oren. Thank you so much. Well, first and foremost, it's just an honor to be here uh, and to be with these wonderful, great artists. Um, I am an artist, uh, and it's funny because as an artist, you go through different phases and stages, even as you kind of title yourself and even with your work. And um, being from originally from Memphis, Tennessee, I always start off my introduction by saying I was actually born five months after Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. And I say that because this is something that continues to come through my artwork. Uh, I've been known to call myself an artivist now, which is this formed word, which I actually feel a lot of my work is. Uh, even at times when I try to escape that uh, is a voice that's always been a part of me because of who I am and, and how I was raised and where I was raised. And so I'm glad that now others can kind of view and hopefully what I want out of a lot of my work in just a general sense is as all artists do, you wanna pull people in, you wanna create dialogue, but I love the three uh, elements that I say, I want to educate, elevate, and challenge, and challenge the viewer when they look at my work, to pull them in closer and just to see and, and try to connect with the image uh, and what they're looking at and what they see. And so first off, I wanna talk about the two pieces that were actually chosen for uh, this wonderful, wonderful exhibit. Uh, the first one, which is Sick and Tired, uh, and that piece has a lot of elements in it. And this piece actually is a proclamation. A proclamation for me as an African-American man growing up, as I said, in the South and finally moving here to the Bay Area uh, and understanding my difference. And what I mean by difference is not necessarily being better than, but just uniquely me. 
And so what I wanted to do was, I love in my pieces is having this juxtaposition of, when you think about the time in the 60s when it was the pinnacle of the civil rights movement, uh, even fast forwarding to today, how a lot of the things, even though there have been some growth and a lot of change, how unfortunately a lot of things are the same. And this piece is kind of that final proclamation with the different elements in it. And I just kind of want to talk about a few of the elements uh, as we look at the work here. Uh, I want to start first with the lotus flower that's actually on the side there, that's actually airbrushed in, or aerosoled in, excuse me. And of course, the lotus flower means rebirth. And as I talked about earlier, dealing with the civil rights movement and dealing with just the movement when you have the Black Lives Matter movement in this 2020, unfortunately, due to a lot of the things that happened uh, that was sparked by Mr. George Floyd's murder. Um, I thought about the rebirth of this movement and this revolution. And so I wanted it there on the side of the West as if the sun is actually starting to set. Uh, and as we move throughout the piece, and it's a few more elements I want to point out, if you look at the megaphone, and in the megaphone, um, one of the key elements that I really love is actually sheet music. And the sheet music is actually We Shall Overcome, a song that was sung, uh, especially during the civil rights movement with Dr. King as he led this march in Selma, and even in Memphis, Tennessee for the uh, sanitation workers. Uh, but at the time, it's something that's even said today with not only my generation, but even the progressive generation, the younger generation is saying that we're kind of tired of singing that song. And so I placed it inside a megaphone to change kind of the element of the song from being something that sung to more of a proclamation to saying that we shall overcome uh, to punctuate uh, the movement and where we are today. Uh, when you look at the gentleman there that's holding the megaphone, if you look around his eye, you actually see these dots there. And something that I wanted to have in my work, I wanted to connect, uh, especially the plight of African-American men, me, myself, being African-American male, as you go through life trying to find that identity. One thing that we're always told as we grow up um, is that we actually come from royalty. When we go all the way back to uh, the original roots of Africa, we think about that we come from kings and queens. And this is something that's kind of passed along even during rites of passage and a lot of things. And so. I wanted to emulate that. I, one piece, which we'll talk about in a minute, where can you hear me, you'll see a monocle on some of my images, which establishes royalty. Uh, but then I actually wanted to use that same kind of format and element and do it in more in the tribal sense. And keeping within that theme of the tribal sense, if you look at the jacket on the gentleman that's holding the megaphone, you actually see the kente cloth pattern that's on him. And that's to have that continual uh, connection uh, uh, with Africa and his original roots. Uh, as we kind of meander through the crowd, you see some of the key elements of protesters. You also see elements of police officers and SWAT uniforms. And my whole goal for this piece is to take all of these elements and also try to en encapsulate the energy that's with the movement of today. Uh, that's why I chose to do collage. Mixed media has always been my medium of choice. But in this essence, I didn't want to go in a traditional route of more illustrative aspects, but I wanted to use more collage because I wanted to, as I said, encapsulate that energy of today. Uh, and so the last point I wanted to make within the crowd, as you see uh, the crowd and the police there, I put an image of myself in the center as to have that connect, not only as a little boy growing up trying to figure out who I am, but even now uh, in a turn of my life, midlife, uh, understanding who I am. And that understanding is looking at the number six, which is um, the sense of completion when man was created, uh, the original man. And so as we swing over to the uh, next one, which is can you hear me, some of those same elements are there. This piece is also a proclamation as well. And that's why I have the open mouth. It's showing that there's more of a statement uh, that we are finally here and that we are letting it be known that a change has to come. And so I want to actually move to the next slide. This piece is called Animalistic. And this was actually the first piece out of this series of endangered species. And these pieces that you see is coming from that series. And the reason that this piece is called Animalistic because I thought about the aspect of, uh, in the beginning, African-American men, or especially with the history of America when enslavement happened, we were considered three-fourths human. And so I wanted to actually use that. If you look at the image, that's why you have all of this montage of different facial features of different African-American men from the nose, the mouth, and the eyes. And I actually put on these ears that some people see it, they think of Dr. Spock or they think of a Vulcan, but I wanted to kind of create that element of somewhat of an animal to where it almost piece looks alien because this is the category and the label that they gave African-American men 
throughout the time of the century. And so with using that, I still put in that element, if you see the monocle that's on the eye, to regardless of what is seen or what society feels we are, it's that constant connection of us knowing who we are and where we come from as far as royalty. And so again, keeping the energy of, of the movement and endangered species, I wanted to still have um, that element in there uh, to where it helps kind of create the energy within the piece and the movement. And then the next slide. So these pieces here are two of the pieces that's uh, in the endangered species category. Uh, the one on the left, which is a good black man, uh, it kind of resonates from uh, the aspect of when I talked about how black men are kind of seen as animals. Uh, and not only that, but we have so many other labels, um, unfortunately, that are, are given to us as far as criminals, as far as certain different things. And it's almost as if um, I've heard this so much growing up to where we had to live being unapologetically black. Uh, and so with that, I wanted to create this man to where he has to wear a label stating that when you see him, as soon as you see his skin color, he has this advertising on the shirt to say that I'm actually a good black man. And unfortunately, even in my uh, years of growing up, walking in stores and kind of hearing the same stories that you hear from a lot of African-American men as far as being followed whenever you go to a store or whenever you're walking into a parking lot, you see people have this knee-jerk reaction uh, to where they lock their car as soon as you see them. And so it's a lot of that mental pressure and mental stress that we wear as African-American men. And so it's almost where a joke we want to say, we want to have a banner to say, look here, I'm not a criminal. Look here, I'm a good person. Look here, I'm a human being. And so I just wanted to uh, take a play off of uh, that conversation that a lot of African-American men have. Uh, and I put it on his t-shirt in regards to some of those other elements as well, like the kente sleeve, again, to kind of connect him to uh, his original roots. And also, if you look uh, over the right eye there, you see the tribal marks with the dots. Now, something I do want to talk about uh, also is, in a lot of these pieces, you actually see around the faces, you see uh, this outline of another face. And that's actually to uh, emulate and to show kind of the alter ego, because unfortunately, as African American men, we have to act as if everything is okay, even when we're not feeling that way. And so what that is doing is resonating what's actually going inside internally of how we feel. So it's kind of creating this dual characteristic or this dual personality uh, that we live with. And so again, kind of creating colors and creating elements just to create that movement uh, to have the viewer kind of stay and to really sink in deep to the image that's there. And then to the right, the last piece, which is called Arrested Development. This piece really was the last piece of the series. Um, and this piece really um, exemplifies systemic racism, which is something that's being discussed a lot today. Uh, and so a lot of different elements in this piece, which I, I won't go through all of them, but I just want to point out just a few before I wrap up. Um, if you look at the base there, I use the Black Dahlia. Uh, which is a beautiful flower, uh, but the Black Dahlia represents negativity, uh, sadness. And so when you look at this piece, my goal was to actually try to pinpoint three of the isms that we hear today. When you deal with classism, uh, racism, and even socialism. And so if we look at the classism, we look at here, you see two boys that are actually within the jail system. Uh, and so um, I think here, as you see them actually catching eye with the gentleman there on the side, I am a man, is to remind them that they are still uh, young black men and they are still important here. So that's just it in a nutshell. Uh, I hope you get a chance to not only see uh, the work after the young, but also feel free to uh, look at my website to see more and to hear more about the work. Thank you. Warren, that was really great and your works are very powerful. Thank you. I had a quick question about, uh, can you hear me now? And your work has so many layers and levels of detail. I noticed in Sick and Tired, for example, that there are law enforcement officers carrying the Confederate flag, um, which is a historical element and unfortunately a contemporary element we're all too familiar with, where the people who are assigned to protect everyone's rights are often the ones who are abrogating them. But I wanted to ask you about a detail and can you hear me now? We have the legendary now 
uh, signs carries saying I am a man, um, which have been addressed by contemporary artists today. Um, and I think it was during the Memphis uh, garbage men's strike, workers strike. Uh, you're from Memphis, so that's appropriate. Uh, it's your home turf. But I noticed that one of them is framed, and this is what I wanted to ask you about. It reminds me of Lorraine O'Grady's Art Is project. We just had the Great Soul of a Nation exhibition, and of course she went to Harlem. During a parade, she, had, she and her assistants walked through the crowds, holding up picture frames, painting frames to the crowd uh, to sort of empower them. You know, I am art, I am worthy, I am uh, worth something, I'm worth a lot. And I, the question I was wondering is why you included the frame around the sign, and it makes me wonder if it's a comment that are these signs still being used and still relevant, or are they relegated like a work of history or an, a historical artifact to the past, and now it's framed on someone's wall rather than being carried in the streets? Good question, Tim. Thank you. And it's actually both. Uh, and if you look at it, not only is it framed, but I also have an attachment to the monocle. So that was my, my way of actually making it also relevant today, as well as its past and historical relevance as well. And yes, these signs and this phrase, in fact, it's, it's becoming more profound today than it was then because as I talked about the juxtapositioning now, the fact that we still today are having to say that I am a man, that I am human. And so to answer that question, yes, it's actually for both. So thank you. Great, thank you. All right, that was really fabulous. And now we'd like to move on to our second artist in the De Young Open, Every Kwong. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to just start by uh, giving you a little background before I go into the two paintings that are in the show. So anyways, um, my mother... Uh, grew up in Chinatown. My father grew up in Palo Alto and I was born in San Francisco. My parents actually named me after a boat uh, called the Everyman, which in 1962 sailed out into the Pacific Ocean from the Sausalito Bay to protest nuclear bomb testing. So Everyman, which is Everyman, my name, Every, uh, that's where it comes from. So my parents were like beatnik hippies and they had a lot of artists and writer friends and intellectuals. And so that was kind of my upbringing. And um, one of the things that I remember as a kid is when their friends would come to the house, when they would enter the door, they would say, power to the people, black is beautiful, and long live China. And, and as a kid hearing those words, it really struck a chord in me. And it's really interesting to think about those words now today. I think they're, it's interesting. I think they're very relevant today. So anyways, um, I went to the San Francisco Art Institute and got my MFA and BFA in drawing and painting. And um, um, I, uh, let's see here. I also went to the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. And so, which brings me now, I'd like to talk about uh, this land is your land, this land is my land. This uh, painting drawing is actually on a window shade and it's Sharpie permanent marker and acrylic on window shade. Um, this piece is about the haves and have nots. Um, it's also about um, around 2016, uh, what was going on in the world then uh, with the elections. So in the center panel, there's an opulent uh, dinner feast. Uh, and again, showing the people that have all this food and luxury next to another panel uh, on the left about the Syrian war and then on the right. So they're all about these things about our country and what is going on. For example, it's about voting rights it's about the border wall. It's about the elections uh, of the guy in the White House and Hillary Clinton. It's about education. It's about lynching in America. It's all these things uh, that I feel very strongly about and against uh, all the things that he's doing uh, to our country. It's also about Standing Rock, 
climate change, and a whole host of other things. Uh, the images in there, like the ice cream cones and baseball and hot dogs are kind of to offset the disparity and the stark reality of the world we live in. Yeah, so this piece here is titled um, America, Land of the Free and Home of the Brave. And this particular piece was about immigration, about health care, about the other Americans who are Japanese who are put into these internment camps. Um, so this piece started out about the border wall and the kids in cages and thinking about America and who we are. And as I started doing this, I was also thinking about, um, I was actually looking at some photographs of Dorothea Lang's photos of the internment camps and realized that um, you know, this was also in the 1940s that the Japanese were put into these camps without any due process, without any criminal act, they were just forced over 100,000 of them. So six months ago, I find out that my uncle actually was at Manzanar and I was, uh, I was pretty devastated to hear that and they just never talked about that. So in some ways, this is a work um, dealing with um, the past and where we are now as a country and who we want to be moving forward as a nation. So I, you know, I just felt really strongly that I had to do this and I put the White House in the middle of all this. And as I was working nearing the end of this piece, I started thinking about uh, when we had the shelter in place with the COVID-19 in March, I decided to kind of put that in to also kind of highlight the reality of what's going on. So all these things are going on right here and now. And it's really devastating uh, to see uh, this tragedy that didn't really have to be. So for example, in one of the images, it has uh, the trucks uh, outside of the hospitals in New York and New Jersey. And they were in so much desperation uh, for where to put the dead bodies that they used them as freezers. So that piece is definitely something that uh, is, is really a powerful piece. And I also think about um, just the the things that are going on in the world with this. And it's making, I would hope, people really to rise up and think about who we are as people and what do we stand for. I'd like to probably uh, talk maybe about my studio practice. And each painting I do is a meditation in action, not passive, not thinking, not special only responding to shape, color, and form. The grid structure allows me to create one image to bounce off of another. So I might try to start it very intuitively by one panel and then jumping to the next and back to the first and back and around again. So that's really uh, my practice in, in its basic essence. Um, the work, I really don't think about it until I step back and look at what I've done. And then I say, okay, well, maybe I can make this a little bit darker, this a little bit lighter, or maybe these images don't uh, quite work well together. But uh, that's uh, my studio practice. Uh, the next two projects that I'm working on is about African Americans in the United States. Uh, from 19, from 1619 to all the way up to the present of all the race riots and to do a pair, compare and contrast of what happened then and what's happening now. And once that's done, I'm also doing research about Asian Americans in America and we'll kind of take the same idea of kind of, you know, doing some research on all the riots, race riots, and to do a compare and contrast on all the laws that prevented Asians from, from uh, advancing and being equal. And I think that, I think that sums it up, that's it. 
Thank you, Avery. That was really great. And thank you for showing uh, the amazing intersection, which you just learned between your family's personal history and a lot of the political issues that you're addressing in your work. I wanted to ask a, make an observation and ask a question. Um, the two works in the De Young Open, uh, This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land, and America Land of the Free and Home of the Brave. The Woody Guthrie song uh, from 1940, a lot of Americans don't know there were two verses that are almost never performed, one in which critiques private property and therefore implicitly capitalism, and the other one critiques the pervasiveness of poverty in America. And then of course, with America Land of the Free Home of the Brave, you have the national anthem. Uh, Francis Scott Key was a slave owner. And there's a verse in the national anthem that again is typically not performed for obvious reasons uh, because it's deeply prejudicial and uh, racist. And so the question I wanted to ask is um, not only your awareness of those dichotomies uh, between what we think we know about these iconic songs and then what they actually contain and their actual origins. But more importantly, the ways in which Americans choose to see or not to see some of these issues, not just in the songs, of course, but in the country. Um, and in particular, I'm, we were all very moved and very taken with the idea that when you paint your works on a window shade, it implicitly brings to the fore the idea that someone could pull the shade up or down and choose to look or not to look at what's going on outside their own windows. So that's a, that's a big uh, question there. That's a lot. Um, uh, I can only respond to basically, I, I, you know, I did read all the national anthem. I read all those things about the civil war and the songs and things like that. Um, I can only say that I hope people would be curious enough to actually research maybe the Confederate flag and who made the flag and what he said about it. I would hope that the people would be interested in researching some of that history on their own because I'm really not a history person that much, but after I started reading all these things and like about the national anthem and the I think it was uh, in the third verse of the national anthem, some of the words in there were quite chilling. So I would urge uh, all people to hopefully, if they can dig a little deeper uh, to their history, um, it might be, it might shed some light on things. And I, I hope that people won't, um, what is it, turn away, but they need to engage. Um, people need to engage and it's not going to get any easier if they don't. And that's one of the things that will help us as a nation and as a people move forward. But it's actually understanding our true history. So for example, you know, Lincoln, I thought he was, you know, I thought he ended slavery, but he really didn't. And if you look at the documents and what he said, he, he wanted to save the union. And so, I mean, I can go on and on with some of the things in here, but, uh, but I think it's important that people be curious. So I'm not even sure if that answers your question, but, um, but I think, uh, like I said, as a, as a country and as a nation, uh, if people are gonna fly the flag or do whatever they're gonna do, I think that's fine, but they should actually look at what those, those symbols really mean. Uh, why are those monuments coming down? And I believe even Robert E. Lee didn't even want the monuments. I think he was saying that he did, don't make them, please don't make them. And I think that was in 1869, if I'm correct, before he died. Thank you, Avery. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, we'd like to go to the third artist in the exhibition. Rupi C. Tut also has works in the first gallery of the exhibition, which address a lot of contemporaneous and historical issues and often link the two. So Rupi, could you please tell us about your works in the exhibition? Thank you, Tim. I'm really excited to be part of the Diang Open, and I think the conversation today not only enriches why I make work, but also hopefully has um, additional me meaning added for the audiences. Um, 
and I've been asked to introduce myself. So I'm Rupi C. Tut and I'm talking from my closet in my home. And I'm really excited that um, I get to kind of voice what my work shows. Um, I, as an artist, did not start out uh, in the field of art. I have a public health background. And I think being an immigrant child, it's kind of a way that I chose to honor the struggles of my parents to go find something more financially stable to pursue. Um, however, I think my calling was definitely towards not only art, but also very specifically traditional Indian art, um, which I eventually was able to train in. And I think the beauty of being trained as a traditional painter is that you also kind of have to do a spiritual and uh, kind of your, your global mindset changes because all of a sudden traditional art becomes your way of living and also your way of working as an artist. So when I introduce myself, I usually say I'm a contemporary artist painting a very traditional, um, in a very traditional way. And Indian miniature painting is one of those mediums that uh, has been, or one of those art forms that has been accessed by a lot of artists, but rarely does it always uh, persist in its purity and in its purity of form in its purity of visual language. So what I like to do is to make sure that I honor the ancestors of this painting style and um, continue the language, the visual language, and work really hard and train at kind of continuing it as much as possible. But also because I'm a person living in today's world, add images and add characters and add references that are more relevant to my lived experiences in my life. Um, and with that, I'll definitely try to make sure that in the future, as I build this library of visual language that's more contemporary, um, at the same time, I'm honoring the, um, you know, centuries old visual language that is within this art form, which I'm very thankful to kind of be a torchbearer for. Um, with that, I'll transition to the paintings that I want to address today in the slides. Um, the two paintings that are at the De Young Open that are visible in Gallery 1 and Gallery 8. Uh, the first one is Machinery of Oppression, which is visible in Gallery 1. Um, this painting was actually something that, um, so I always say and always joke about it that whenever something happens in my life today, it'll take me a year to process because traditional mediums just take at least, each painting can take three to four months to actually create. And you can kind of uh, assume the, you know, the research process and also just the emotional and uh, physical process you go through to produce a painting. But this painting for me was a, uh, initially just a, you know, a transition from painting stories of my ancestors who were refugees and who were so related um, to the concept of movement and concept of losing homeland and losing identity because of losing home, that from that transition to then the transition of immigration, which is my own lived experience, experience and with, you know, losing the home that I knew at the age of 12 in India to move here to the U.S. and then all of a sudden discover this, um, the idea of what it means to belong because all of a sudden I didn't belong anywhere. My accent was somewhere between two worlds. And this painting I would say was not necessarily um, kind of a relationship to that immigration experience, but more towards the immigration experience of others that I was witnessing around me that was very much being influenced by the political atmosphere and the political rhetoric. Um, it was my way of getting really angry at what was happening. Uh, with this large, enlarged figure who was kind of controlling the lives of those who are immigrants who are kind of moving our entire country forward. Uh, however, their faces are erased, you know, they are not visible in many ways. There's a sense of erasure they're experiencing, but this large, enlarged figure who is definitely a political figure, um, but also a very socially fueled figure who is being, you know, uh, someone who's wearing clothing that is very much seen in our fashion today that is, you know, the prints are from other cultures and someone who's eating foods that are very much from other cultures. But at the same time, they're kind of clenching their future in their hands and these papers that this figure is clenching, which could be visas, could be m money, could be just anything related to the lives of those figures who are driving the entire country forward, who are um, experiencing this huge burden and pressure of moving the country forward, but not receiving much in it. Uh, in return. However, at the same time, this entire figure is very well protected by our constitution in this umbrella. So for me, this painting was 
an ex incredible experience in blending the two homelands I care about, which is India and um, and the US. And even in India specifically, when I grew up in Punjab, there's a population that has dealt with a lot of migration and immigration abroad. So these topics of movement and then also how that movement and migratory patterns are taken advantage of by political and social um, mechanisms and systems is what this work was about. Um, I'm a huge sci-fi fan, so I had to put in the <laughs> I had to put in the the blood sucking element of this large figure. So if you have been a Mad Max fan, that's where that's coming from. So these figures are kind of blood bags for this really greedy um, enlarged figure in the center. And many say it's you know a particular figure, but I just leave that up to the audience to think about and to relate depending on who they are. Um, the second painting that's in Gallery Eight. The Time Traveler. Um, this painting was a, you know, it's one of the paintings I completed earlier this year before our world kind of um, really showed us what climate breakdown meant. Um, this painting was, you know, the first in the climate breakdown series I was addressing, but it's a second in the series where the female figures are the central, central um, part of the painting. And here the Time Traveler is definitely a figure who has, you know, these superpowers or you can say she has foresight that a lot of individuals don't tend to have. And for me, mothers and female figures in my life have been the ones who've had that foresight, which is why the time traveler is a woman, because she is coming into um, this land, which was then at that time, California, when I was digesting the work, uh, when we had the campfire and we had the fires in, um, in different parts of our state. And she's arriving at a point where she is, you know, all that's left of the world that she knew of is this feather of a beloved bird. And this bird is important to me because um, this bird is, this feather comes from a bird that sounds very similar to a bird I could hear growing up. And all of a sudden now this bird visits the redwoods in my backyard in Oakland. So for me, it's always a connection about uh, finding belonging in many places. But at the same time, how do I connect what I've cared about growing up and what I see now where my children are growing up um, and how those two worlds kind of collide and are important in, um, in their own sense. Okay, I'm gonna go, go to the next slide. So this is the first painting that was in the series of um, where the female figure is at the center of the painting and is the most important figure. The storyteller came before the time traveler and the reason for that is because many times even in miniature painting or even in eastern eastern twists that are added to some paintings uh, older women don't find a central place and for me the storytelling the uh, knowledge and also the um, the moral values and work ethic that I have been imparted by my grandmothers and by the w older women in the family, they deserve center stage. And usually these kind of portraits in the miniature style were done for emperors and for imperial figures, but very, very rarely do you see an older character holding that space and kind of standing on top of the world and kind of, uh, and, you know, occupying physical space, which I feel is what the struggle that many women have. We have to occupy more physical space in terms of before we even occupy space beyond the physicality of it. If we can go to the next slide, please. The very first um, reason I started to paint movement and displacement, like I mentioned earlier, was um, because my grandparents were refugees of the 1947 partition of India. And I grew up on stories of a home far away of places and land that you know I didn't have access to, but kind of made them feel a sense of home just talking about those places. So for me, the, the plight of refugees and what they've gone through in, in their lives became even more relevant when I, be, when I immigrated as a child. But at the same time, um, when I saw a lot of climate refugees, you know, um, undergoing similar challenges, but also when it's coming so close to home, even when the fires were happening close to us, and a lot of friends and a lot of family members were losing homes in California. At that time, I realized that there is a, there is a kind of a divine element within refugees or within people who have to leave a place to never come back. 
um, within Indian miniature painting, there is a tradition where painters would paint, you know, the feet of the gods that they worship. And the, though that painting would go with the painter wherever he, he, wherever he went, because it was mostly males. And for me, the, this painting, Memory of the Divine, is kind of my way of claiming that these refugees or these people who are going through this um, mass movement, mass displacement, and surviving and showing resilience, these are the feet that I would choose to not worship, but memorialize in my studio. And this is the painting I would take with me when I would travel as a painter in my heart, of course, not carry the physical thing. But for me, this, this painting uh, symbolizes a lot more also because this painting involved a lot of research into the Holocaust and into what is remaining when people have left a space. And there's a lot of visuals from the 1947 partition and also the Holocaust where there's just a lot of luggage, shoes, um, and a lot of personal articles remaining as, um, as a direct result of people just leaving, people having gone uh, forcefully or by choice. And the last painting I want to mention is the second in the climate breakdown um, series that I was, I was um, addressing before the climate actually broke down in the way that we were, uh, you know, we were hit by this pandemic, is this painting called Cosmic Breakdown. And I think for me at that time to digest a lot that was happening in the world based on my reading of how climate is impacting more than I can even imagine. Um, and I had to get into this painting because it has a little bit of a meditative mode because all these circles, all these lines are done by hand, of course, and they've taken this painting took at least three and a half months to create. But there's also a mixture of these mythical creatures alongside, you know, creatures like the hammerhead shark and the blue whale who are endangered. Um, so for me, it's all about making sense of what is actually there, what this painting style gives me from the centuries of um, visual knowledge that I have. And then also what I feel about those things today and how do I address them together. So for me, when I'm painting anything, it's very important to address a part, part of my history, my personal history, a part of the world's history and lived experience, but also bring in elements from this painting form, Indian miniature painting, to make sure that historically I'm moving the painting form forward as well as I move forward as an artist, because um, I would hate for it to die and go away. Yeah, so this is kind of the gist of why I paint and what I do. And I think I've probably only touched 10% of it. But um, what I hope is that when individuals do look, come and look closer at the works of the de Young, especially, they find the beauty what is what attracts them. But it's the ugliness of the truth that's hidden underneath is what they actually realize and kind of go away with a heavier heart just a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about my work today. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Rupi, that was fascinating. I would love to ask a question about Machinery of Oppression, the first work and one of the works in the exhibition. And I appreciate, I think it's really interesting as the country, as the United States, deals with all the issues that are confronting it have been long always been there and are now coming more to the fore for a lot of people that you deal with, on some level, uh, the issue of global imperialism. I think there is often a short-sightedness where we, we look outside our own window or our own door, but we don't always look beyond. And it reminds me of the very famous quote by Malcolm X, where he said, as long as we think we should get Mississippi straightened out before we worry about Congo, we'll never get Mississippi straightened out. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that you see the big picture and sort of link these global issues. I wanted to also ask, a specific question, since you are clearly an aficionado of Indian miniature painting and both respect its history and, as you said, would like to move it forward, I'm wondering if the history of the painting itself as a style, as a form, as it evolved, is actually also inflected by colonialism and encounters with European cultures, European styles of art and perspective and form and figure and all the above. And if that's a kind of cultural hybridity that you discussed, it really speaks to you or seems appropriate on some level for your own experience. Yeah, I, I think uh, you've kind of hit, hit the nail on the head with that because 
I cannot uh, even speak of the history of this painting form without addressing the influence of colonialism on it. Um, the fact that it is not practiced even more often now is because it kind of died off during colonialism and also lost its status as a legitimate art form. And, you know, even now kind of ends up in this sometimes ethnic art category for many people and not necessarily a painting form that has a lot of complexity behind it. Um, for me, it's it's definitely an opportunity to address that when I am uh, when I am addressing, for example, the imperialism in this painting. It's also an opportunity to address the the way miniature painting has been um, kind of stopped in its growth, because many of the times the workshops that were propagating this painting form forward were not supported anymore, and you know they've become only these government supported initiatives. And I personally did not train in those workshops in India. I trained in London because to me that was more accessible. But at the same time, there's also the positive side of it because I can train in London because it's closer. Uh, and that is also a direct influence of the British involvement in India. Um, at the end of it, I would say that, you know, for, for many reasons right now, Indian miniature painting is not being pursued as often or as much by artists who look like me. Uh, artists whose heritage kind of directly relates to Indian miniature painting. However, um, if we don't, if we don't have artists who are related to that heritage, relate to the colonial impact of, you know, on their entire lives, because for example, patriarchy and things like that, they're all colonial impacts in our lives that I live every day, then we don't get to have a rich enough conversation about the impact of colonialism, not just on painting styles, but also populations and also histories and also families and individuals. So when I do see a, I do see a lot more painters coming up who are pursuing this style, for me, it's very important to make sure that I stay as focused in and as honed in onto the stories that are specifically about miniature painting, but also very specifically about who I am and where I'm coming from. So for me, for example, it would not be a, it would not be a good proposition to all of a sudden give up this painting style and paint a very contemporary way of depicting what I want to depict. Because for me, it's very important to link back to the past in order to explain the present, because that's what we're doing. Uh, I cannot explain my present here in the US without explaining, you know, my grandfathers who fought under the British um, in the world in World War Two. So it, the, I think that the beauty is there's a string that I continue to work on to make sure that stays connected, but I would want so many more rupees to do that so that the conversation can be elevated and can be richer. That's great, thank you. And thank you, Rupi, and thank you, Oren and Every. I think all of us can now fully appreciate at a deeper, higher level, um, the ways in which these artists' visions are backed up by really powerful voices, so thank you. And also the incredible degree of awareness and perception and thought that goes into these works. Um, specifically, all three artists really very consciously and carefully linking the past to the present and possibly even the future and what kind of future we'd all like to see. So thank you. And of course, I know you are all been watching and listening uh, with questions, including many of you who've already been to the exhibitions to see their works in person. I urge you to see them and look at their websites and uh, follow their works. So we'd like to turn it over now to you and to have people send in their questions and the artists will respond. So we already have our first questions. And the first question is for Oren. And it's a two part question. Um, one is the dimensions of your work. And I know the two works in the De Young Open are relatively small. And I wonder if you're striving for a kind of intimacy, almost handheld objects. And then the other part of the question is uh, your use of collage and paint. And I wonder if you could speak to the use of collage specifically, why that's important and why it sometimes seems to be images or texts from the past. Oh, great questions. Uh, and first, as far as size, I, I did, with, especially with this series, I wanted to work a little smaller uh, for two reasons. One, because as you said, Tim, to be a little bit more intimate and then also to give that feeling of confinement because it is something that we're constantly dealing with to give that edge and to kind of give that same energy as we talk about uh, with the movement that's going on, just to encapsulate all of that there. 
Um, and regarding collage, um, for me, I feel as human beings, we all feel with layers. And that's the beauty that I love with collage is that you, you have this opportunity, as I talked about, pulling in the viewer. Uh, and so it's kind of this hide and seek kind of element that I wanted to do with that. But also, especially in this, is because there are so many different pieces to this movement, so many different pieces to, to the historical aspect of this plight of African-American men and even myself, I just felt that it was definitely uh, something that was fitting for this for this particular series. And painting, it kind of goes with each piece. You know, I would start off in my concepts and my color swatches. Some of these I actually did in Photoshop first on the iPad and kind of started to build them and then added color. And it actually changed as all artists, we know that spontaneity kind of kicks in to where it speaks differently once it's on the final sheet. So it really depends on the energy that I, I feel as I'm doing the piece. So thank you for the question. Great. We have a question for every uh, regarding your use of your figures that seem to have a they, uh, the questioner saying a Pinocchio like or doll like a marionette like aspect and a kind of anonymity and they're wondering specifically if there's a sort of anti Disney industrial complex commentary there or what your rationale is for using those types of seemingly anonymous uh, figures. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, those figures, I just they they just came about through exploration, and um, I think they became more about the physical act of what they were doing than what the faces, and that's why they don't really have eyes or noses or anything. Um, so it's it's kind of hard for me to. I I still don't really know for sure, but I think it's about the physical. Uh, action with the figure in, in space, moving in space and what they're doing more than the face itself, actually. Okay. And then, uh, Rupi, someone is wondering about your use of birds as symbols and if that has special meaning for you personally and your work. And then also connecting uh, your use of traditional historical precedents with contemporary tools and processes. Wow. Uh, very different questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, birds are used uh, very often just because birds also have a huge significance for me. In, uh, I th because I'm Punjabi Sikh, we have birds are mentioned very often in the poetry and they're used as um, they're used as kind of uh, guides as to what's a good way to be and what's not a great way to be. So like birds like the heron and, uh, you know, they, they just come so often in in this type of poetry and I'm very close to the poetry of the Punjabi language. Um, and I think for all the paintings, I always try to add birds in because also they're a huge challenge to paint in this traditional format. So I like to challenge myself to paint a different bird each time. You might see more falcons and that family of birds because they were symbolisms of uh, royal or power, uh, powerful connections or powerful status. And I'd like to kind of transfer that status and power to the characters I put in my paintings versus the ones that were typically depicted. Um, the second question, I might ask you to repeat it actually. I was thinking it was a question about um, traditional historical precedents, but then what kinds of materials and processes do you use? Are they, are they also traditional tools and techniques and processes or are some of them modern and contemporary? Yes, I strongly be believe that I could paint all I want, but if I don't kind of use the traditional processes and tools and methodologies, then what's the point? Because uh, when the paintings will live on, you know, my name would be attached to them, but the process and the tools and the method methodology will die because there's no manuals that I study from to learn all of this. There's actual individuals who demonstrate and that I learn from practice and watching. Um, so very much these tools and these methodologies also connect me back, <laughs> oddly enough, to a lot of the kitchen elements that, you know, my grandmother might have used. So which is really interesting to find that intergenerational uh, connection as to the posture I have to put on or the type of tools I'm using, the type of hand movements I'm using to grind pigments, to burnish paper. Um, and also, I think because a lot of these processes are repetitive, it allows you a lot of time in getting attached to the process of making versus the actual work. Cause it could go wrong if a recipe goes wrong and it does go wrong. So I think very, very importantly, I do use traditional methods and tools. 
Um, but there are, you know, innovations being made in each of these and people are using different things if they're becoming too hard to stick to the traditional materials and tools. But I'm a purist in that way. So I'll, I'll keep doing it this way for now. And Oren, I'm uh, wondering with your work, um, drawing in the works in the De Young Open on the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, do you see that personally and as an artist as um, something powerful, a foundation to build upon, or is it actually double-edged that we're still dealing with all these same issues and that having to re-embrace or recycle or rethink about those same issues, you know, is it, is it, is it nuanced? Is it double-edged? Are there gray areas in there and how you personally feel about, about those issues and those subjects? It is. It's funny that you asked that question, Tim, because even um, as we, you know, dealt with so much that happened this summer, um, I, I even tell people, even though 2020 is probably a lot of people kind of joke around and say, well, I want to see it as a leap year because it's one of those years we kind of want to forget. Artistically, it's probably one of the best years for me um, because artistically, as I said, this this idea and this series that I've been, you know, um, thinking about and conceptualizing for two to three years uh, finally came into fruition. And especially growing up in Memphis, Tennessee, the civil rights movement, even the photography, like Gordon Parks is probably one of my favorite photographers. And, and just seeing the historical aspect of these pieces to where um, it's, it's great to feed from, it's great to be inspired by, but as you said, it's also, um, that's where that double-edged sword comes into play to where it's, it's very depressing, the fact that we are still kind of dealing with some of those issues. And that's where I talked about that juxtaposition in my pieces, why I wanted to use those elements to kind of show like, it's for, I want viewers to kind of look, even in the sick and tired, when you think about that piece, if you look in the crowd, there's a mixture of two crowds of collage that I use. One that was doing uh, one of the, I have a dream speech. And then there was another that was a more recent photo. And I, I tried to intertwine them to where if you have to really go in close to see that they're actually two different time periods. So yeah, so I think it's, it's definitely both, Tim, and, and, and artistically it feeds me, but spiritually and physically it's, it's, it's depressing and, and, and tiring at the same point. But I think that's the life of an artist too. <laughs> that's, that's how we kind of create from that struggle and from that sure. point, so. Yeah, and um, Every, I wanted to ask you about your sort of um, kaleidoscopic, because you have uh, both monotone, monochrome, you know, uh, but also chromatic use of color in your works. Um, is that sort of, uh, you know, montage collage effect that reminds people at first glance like a comic format of, you know, traditional comic strips and so forth? Um, I'm curious about your thinking behind it. I mean, it certainly seems to be snapshots, um, not unlike a scrapbook of different parts of America or different parts of people's lives, including ones we don't know about or don't think about or don't want to see. But I'm curious about that specific element of subdividing your compositions that way. Yeah, originally um, those, uh, it came about, uh, I had a sketchbook and in the sketchbook, I did a series of drawings and um, I placed them, I ripped them out of the sketchbook and placed them on the ground. And I thought, well, couldn't I just put this on one large sheet of paper or something and I figured out maybe how about like a window shade because I could roll it up and transport it easily. Um, so it was more about that being able to uh, tell a narrative, I guess. And um, that's stayed with me for quite a while now. And I kind of enjoy the, the idea that you can go from one image to the next image back to the first image and kind of let the idea evolve as it goes. So I, I usually have an idea and then I just see where it goes and, and how it uh, develops as I go. But it, and, and the coloring and the monochrome idea is to kind of offset maybe the brutality of some of the images to kind of give a contrast yeah, that's great. That's, you know, it's wonderful, you know, in a way it's like you're providing the words and then the viewers can make up the sentences that, you know, when, uh, sort of their own choosing. So, um, Rupi, someone asked if you've shown your work in India and how it was received, if you have. I have, uh, there's a lot of collectors of my work in India as well. So I think uh, speaking of just who 
gets attracted to an older traditional style. So there's obviously collectors, but I have not done a formal exhibition and I was raised in India till I was 12. So you can see I've shown my work from that time there in <laughs> India, but not as a professional artist, um, you know, but I was, the plans were to go and train more to be able to access some of these older paintings that are considered heritage and they don't really leave India. And it's very important to see these older paintings in order to know what the masters were doing. So my plan is to go back there just to be able to, um, you know, study these paintings lying somewhere in a metal cabinet, probably uh, in one of the museums or multiples. Um, yeah, but no, I have not formally shown my work there. Um, so we want to wrap up soon for everyone else who's watching, probably want to have, go have their dinners. <laughs> and, uh, but I want to just give you all one last comment on a general question. Uh, something along the lines of, um, I had chosen you and your works um, for this program because you are all deeply engaged in using your work uh, to address and perhaps remediate social, political, cultural issues of interest to each of you individually, but also collectively. And I'm curious if you could just sort of say in a few sentences to wrap up tonight, if uh, how you feel that using art for political purposes while allowing that it also has great aesthetic, intellectual, spiritual, and other components by, by nature, almost by definition. Um, how you feel that it is an effective way when what we've been watching for the past nine months or so, uh, well, years really, unfortunately, or decades, take your pick, um, is activism that's out in the streets and so forth. But I, I do note there's a work in the exhibition, and I'm sorry I'm going to mangle the title, but it, it's something to the effect of no revolution was ever won without a poet. Um, and so I just wonder, starting with Oren, and we'll go right through the same order, Oren, if you could just say a few sentences about why this type of work is important to you and why you feel, if you do, that it could have meaningful impact on society. Oh yeah, great. Uh, one, even though I try to stray away from it, it is a part of who I am, which I think is a wonderful aspect in itself. And then two, I wanna take a something from actually something that Dave Chappelle said. He talked about how a lot of times in order for him to, um, to give people the truth, he has to end it with a punchline. And I feel even as artists, a lot of times that's what I feel I'm called to do as a storyteller and as a historian to do this. And so I'm great that there's an audience for it. Uh, and I just pray that more will want to see and receive it and, and, and learn from it. Right, mm. Great. And every? Yeah, as an artist, um, uh, I just was um, propelled to just make this work. I don't, there's, it just, I just have to make this work in the face of all the stuff that's going on right now. And I could say the, the breakthrough point right now that I'm very excited about is that the fact that I wanna make paintings that actually um, show the past and where we are now and kind of make the comparison that, you know, if we wanna be a better civilized society, we have to really look at things in a deeper way. And Ruby. Um, I'm, I kind of agree with what Oren said too, that sometimes making this work as an artist comes from also what you are composed of as a person. So if you as a person is always in training to become an activist or in training to help the world around you um, to be a better place for yourself and for those around you, then as an artist, you nor like you just automatically and naturally make work that is going to uh, impact the world in a way that it the world listens and also that the world changes. Um, but I do think that it's wrong to apply activism as a requirement to art. But at the same time, for me, I think I like to package that activism and package that social change I want to see in a very beautiful packaging. So it's attractive. So for me, I think that's where I try to make sure that the beauty of the work, as well as the brutality, a word Avery used of the work is, um, you know, in high amounts. And, and I think the impact that it makes could be meaningful if me as a person is continually growing as well. I cannot just have my work speak if I'm not really working on myself as a human. 
That's great. Thank you. So I want to I want to thank all of you so much for joining today uh, in this panel discussion, but also for honoring us with your work at the De Young Museum. Thank you for joining, um, you know, applying to the De Young Open, uh, overcoming ridiculous odds and getting in. <laughs> Um, but seriously, to all the artists in the exhibition, um, there are 877 amazing works of art there. And uh, we're thrilled to have you with us tonight. I wish we could have every artist on. And it's really been an extraordinary uh, experience for everyone uh, at the De Young Museum with the De Young Open. We are closed now. We don't know when we'll reopen. We certainly plan to. And we will take our cues from the city and the state. Uh, but I know many of you have seen the exhibition and know how deeply powerful and moving it is and it'll have a lasting impact. So thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much, Tim, Every, Oren, and Rupi. That was wonderful. Next week, please join us for a second round of presentations from the artists featured in the De Young Open exhibition. We will explore the power of films and moving images, hosted by Claudia Schmuckli, our curator of contemporary art and programming. See you next week.